Um, when myself and fellow co-founder Claire McGatrick sat down to draft this presentation, we came across this quotation uh, written by Gandhi. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and the quotation finishes, then you win. And we thought for a second, could that, could that quote be applied to the conflict that I really see we're engaged in when it comes to uh, winning identity rights for adopted people and the rights of natural parents and siblings to reconnect with the children, the brothers and sisters that were lost to adoption. So unfortunately I think it's too early to say that we will win and when I went back over some of the, um, the contemporary quotes that I, I planned to use which you know, I've mined from um, you know, the Iraq this database, uh, some of the adoption board's own reports uh, one or two bits and pieces, uh, I discovered the, the line in our conflict hasn't been as straightforward as Gandhi suggested. So I'll just give you um, a slight introduction to Adoption Rights Alliance as well. Uh, this is probably our favourite quote and I think for those of us who are used to a certain diminishment of ad adopted people's need to, to find their identities, I think this is the most perfect rebuttal and those of you who are of perhaps my generation and older will remember the, the TV, the excellent, I think it was a HBO series back in the 80s. We were all rooted to it, well, excuse the pun, every Saturday night. Um, but I think that says it all. And I think, Christy, you echoed some of what was, is, uh, is said in this quote as well. And we also like this quotation, uh, which was by the Reverend uh, C. Griffith. He's in Australia. And adoption loss is the only trauma in the world where the victims are expected by the whole of society to be grateful. I think we can apply that to both adopted people and natural parents. Um, Mary Slattery earlier on read out the quote from Kunov, which said that uh, natural parents, natural mothers, can move on um, with their lives in a meaningful, meaningful way. I think that's what it was, Mary. So, and that somehow this. Uh, renting of children from their mothers is something it's considered all too frequently as an overall positive experience whereas uh, many of us can attest to the opposite. Now we founded in 2009, uh, Claire and myself and uh, later we were joined by Mary Steed who many of you will know she's one of the banished babies, she was trafficked to the US in the 1960s and we came out of a group called Adoption Ireland, which was founded in 2000. So as Rhoda and Adoption Losses, we are also unfunded, voluntarily run, um, we're an advocacy organisation. And you, you'll, some of you who have seen our Facebook page or our website will note that we've increased the number of Ireland's um, estimated adopted adults up to 100k. Previously been, we've been running with the figures 50 to 60k, but the great thing that um, the Philomena effect has brought and also the revelations about various mother and baby homes is that the artificial uh, distinction between those people who were adopted prior to 1952 and the introduction of adoption and those adopted post-52, that has fallen <coughs> asunder. And I think I would, um, I think it's uh, behoves politicians, policy makers to recognise that now. Adopted people don't care whether they were adopted with or without legislation, they're adopted, their identities were torn from them and we need solutions. And we exist really because of the absence of state services. So we provide peer support, which of course is essential for anybody undertaking a search, not just um, independently, but also perhaps through um, a HSE or private adoption agency. Now, as we've heard from Trina this morning, the HSE waiting lists are running at about three years duration. So the vast majority of people, quite correctly now, are engaged in a self-search. So increasingly, the demands put on our very meagre resources are, are being stretched to their absolute limits. So I'd apologise to anybody who might have emailed us over the last few months, but we were barely recovering from the wonderful publicity we got from, from Philomena and Jane uh, when we were bounced straight into the awful revelations in the mother and baby homes. Ironically, revelations that we, we all took for granted. We weren't shocked by them. Uh, you know, we perhaps sanitised the existence of mass graves in these mother and baby homes by talking about angel plots, a phrase which I have to say I've always rejected. 
uh, because I think it just glosses over the very murky history of those places. So uh, anybody wanting more information can go on to our website which is uh, adoptionrightsalliance.com and we also have a Facebook page. So back to Band Gandhi's quote, first they ignore you. So the 1952 Act lays bare the the degree to which uh, future interests of the adopted child were to be ignored. There is absolutely no reference to adoption information or, or perish that thought tracing services hadn't even been, they weren't even a glint in anybody's eye at this stage. And the only person who, within the state, who had the power to know adopted people's identities was the chief registrar. And actually, I believe, um, Tom, you might correct me, I think also the registrar at the adoption board itself. Is that, is that true? Yeah, we have, yeah. 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 So, um, and you can see that anybody wishing to establish that information um, would have to go through a court or through the adoption board itself. And then further evidence of this, this is uh, Paddy Cooney, who was Minister for Justice in 1974. Uh, he mentioned this at the first Irish Adoption Workers Conference. I think that we are all agreed that the consensus opinion in our society is to the effect that adoption is better for the illegitimate baby than to be cared for by its mother. Now this is just a mere two years or one year after finally um, single mother's allowance as it was then called or unmarried mother's allowance was uh, was introduced. So instead of paying nuns to mind babies or so, apparently mind babies in these uncaring institutes, we finally in 1972 discovered that it was better to give that money to the mothers themselves. But even on the one hand, so you've got one, hand, or one arm of the government giving money to, to mothers to raise their own children and on the other hand saying they're not suitable. And the laughing element, and there's not too many comedic moments in any of this, but Hawhey is recorded in Mike Malott's book, Banished Babies, uh, where he discussed the carry-on at St. Rita's private nursing home on the Sandyford Road in um, Dublin 4, run by uh, Mary Keating. Somebody, she was being charged, not with whole-scale adoption fraud, not with illegal adoption. No, she was charged only in the 1960s with uh, illegal or improper birth registrations. And that's actually had a very, very bad impact on any of us advocacy groups who've tried to maintain that there has been illegal adoptions over the decades. People like to diminish that and say, no, we're just talking about illegal birth registrations. So Hawhey was, as you know, former um, Taoiseach. And the person who came in to advocate, advocate on Mary Keating's behalf was told sure half the children born at St. Rita's were fathered by members of the Dáil. <coughs> Paddy Cooney again, and this is in response to Mary, Mary Robinson. So she, um, having read Vivian Darling's report, uh, discovered that the regulations surrounding adoption were extremely lax. And she called on the minister in 1974 to introduce regulations. His response, there is no need to have statutory regulations to ensure proper procedures. Now, if he were alive today, that quote would certainly come back to haunt him. I also found examples of where they give us ammunition, some of these uh, commentators. Mary Robinson again, 1974. She compared Denmark to, to Ireland and 93% of unmarried mothers kept their babies in Denmark, whereas 90% of Irish unmarried mothers gave them up. Now, it's my emphasis on the gave them up. I would say, had their children taken from them, because there was no choice for unmarried mothers in Ireland, not really until the 1990s, because most of the mother and baby homes existed until that time. So it was expected, not just by, by government, by social workers, but also by wider society, <coughs> that the best place for an unmarried pregnant woman was to go into one of these homes. And I'd refer you all to the any annual report of the Adoption Authority, which has kept a running total of the percentage of non-marital non children who were taken for adoption. And the absolute zenith of that practice <coughs> was 1967, when 97% uh, 
of all non-marital children were taken for adoption. Now, if we add in the inevitable illegal adoptions, we must surely be talking about 100%. Now, that must be the crassest kind of social engineering that a state could engage in. And I'm quite convinced that we will be having a state apology for that at some point. More ammunition, but this time actually backing up, endorsing adopted people's call to have access to their birth records. Well, actually um, clarifying that birth records need to be factually correct. And we'll often hear the expression original birth certificate. There is no such thing as an original birth certificate. There is a birth cert, which describes the circumstances of each of our births. Those of us who have been adopted, we use an adoption certificate. So when you are going, when you are dealing with state bodies and you are looking for the details of your birth, please ask for your birth certificate because otherwise it, um, it suggests that actually your adoption certificate will suffice. And for those of us who support the call for uh, adopted people to have access to their identities, our birth certs are the absolute minimum requirement. Now, um, the acknowledgement of adopted people's concerns and need for, uh, for identity only hit the adoption board's radar in the 1980s. So I've just plucked out this particular quote from 1984. And I was surprised that there hadn't been an earlier reference because if you think the first adopted person, well, the youngest adopt, formerly legally adopted person reached maturity um, the age of you know, 21 in the 1970s. And in fact, many older adopted people were legally adopted under the 1952 Act as well. So it kind of surprised me that it took this long for for the demand to register. So you can see there were only 52 inquiries allegedly received in 1984. When we come to look at later reports, we'll see that uh, those numbers are beginning to top maybe 1,000 per annum. And there's also uh, recognition that the amount of information on some adoption files is scant. That does not excuse the fact that that information is withheld from adopted people. At the very minimum, they should have access to their birth certs. And we see similar sentiments um, expressed in the annual reports of 86, 87 and 88. And I just think, so, again, some of the choice of language is interesting in some of this. Um, if we look at the second bullet point, where the adoption was arranged by an agency, which is still the practice, it is still a practice of the board to refer the adoptee to that agency. That's fine. But the first bullet point, the board offers counselling service for persons who is, whose adoptions were arranged other ways than by an adoption agency. Now, there's a euphemism at play um, at the adoption board, within the HSE, within the Department of Health. And it's, uh, the euphemism is private adoptions. And that's where private individuals, uh, without being properly accredited, arranged adoptions. Now, that could have been priests, doctors, nuns, solicitors, midwives. And to, we mustn't allow that kind of sanitizing euphemism to escape. We must always stop and ask, are you actually referring to illegal adoptions here? And um, on the, the positive front though, the adoption board, well now the authority, did at least manage to secure some of those files. But there are thousands of files floating out there in the ether, uh, in various solicitors, doctors, offices, etc., which have not come into their possession, and that is very worrying. In 1989, we're back to perhaps ignoring the issue again. There was just a bland note about the increase in tracing requirements received by the board. And I, I actually found the, um, from the 1950s, really up until the 1970s, the board didn't actually comment on its own activities. Um, they had a very scant um, pamphlet, really. It was about yay big, A5, maybe six or eight pages at most which included a list of statistical tables, usually giving information about the age of the adoptive parents, their socioeconomic background, their occupations, and so on. So it's interesting that as the demand for 
um, access to information increases, so do the comments included in the Adoption Board's annual reports. And I was very astonished to find this, that 25 years ago, so a quarter of a century ago, the annual report is 1990. I mean, I just feel we've, we're in a groundhog day. So the Adoption Board actually said that the setting up of a National Contact Register um, was a requirement. And also it recommended that uh, meetings with representative groups should be held. Now, this in, it, it really did surprise me that this was identified as a need so early on. But I would caution that the existence of a National Contact Register is no panacea because, strictly speaking, uh, other countries that have introduced a contact register, they introduce it to a suite of complementary measures, namely giving people full access to their files, age 18. And it's really designed to contact people who maybe have left the jurisdiction but want to make contact with family members that they've lost contact with through adoption. So bear in mind that is 1990. Uh, Rhoda referenced earlier on that she and I sat on an advisory group at the Adoption Board, as it was then called, from 2003 to 2009. Um, we helped design the features of the, the contact register which exists today. We warned then that it would not cut the mustard, that it would not facilitate the pent-up need out there. And I think we've been proven to be correct, with the register barely having achieved 0.5% of all potential matches, or possibly the lowest number of potential matches. I think, Tom, is it about 700, is it? No, 7,000. Yeah. There's about 750 matches. Yeah, yeah. Two people. Yeah. Out of, does it about 11,000 on the register? Yeah. About 70, 40 adopted people. That's right, yeah. So. Nobody in the adoption authority thinks that yeah. is the answer to this either. Absolutely, However, yeah. we I would point out that at the moment it's one of the only games in town and we mm. don't encourage anybody who is interested. Yeah. Let's try and try and see what happens. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Now, I've introduced a new um, description here. I think um, various groups have attempted to gaslight and that's really to sort of make adopted people or natural parents believe that what they're asking for is it so incredibly complex or that it's, they're really being quite unreasonable in requesting this. If I hear once more that adoption is a complex, uh, sensitive and emotional issue and therefore it, that, well, that phrase effectively means that we can rule out any legislation and that also must not be allowed to pass without comment. And I think it's ironic that Alan Shatter, who was, you know, a bit of a hero in opposition and proved to be such of a villain in, in government. So I want to, he said in 1997, as ironically did Frances Fitzgerald, she said something similar then too. I want to nail the suggestion that this is a hugely complex issue. It is an issue that has been properly and adequately addressed in a variety of other countries with a degree of insight and sensitivity necessary to ensure Apologies, Rhoda, that birth mothers can make contact with adopted children where adopted children wish for such contact and to ensure that adopted children can trace their birth mothers and indeed their natural fathers where the information is available and where the natural parents wish for such contact. I urge the Minister to proceed hastily with bringing the necessary legislation before the House. 1997. So every so often, you know, we get this issue is flagged. And I, I really feel that we're going to have to start to doing something radically different because nothing has changed. Uh, there's also elements of undermining us in some, some commentary. And apologies that I'm only plucking quotes now here from the Adoption Board reports. If anybody has any other report by any politician of any political view, I'd be delighted to include them in this because this is a work in process. Now, so... Um, Knowing that many natural mothers despise the phrase birth mothers, I thought it was interesting that this snuck into one of the quotes. Uh, there's also reference to original birth certificates when in fact everybody only has one. Oops, sorry. Um, and then 
This, I think, is one of the first, the third quote here. The board is aware that some are making their own inquiries in the absence of appropriate professional counselling and that in some instances the wrong people have been contacted. Now, I think this is one of the earliest glimpses of beginning to set up adopted people as individuals that wider society, and particularly natural parents, may need protecting from. And we'll see that with... Uh, uh, in very stark light um, later on, something that happened in 2001. And whilst I would agree that it is not, uh, it's not correct that the wrong people, or it's, it's, it's not one wished for that wrong people will be contacted, if, you know, birth registration records were made more readily available, adopted people wouldn't be forced into contacting the wrong individuals. And so here we are in 2000, or sorry, 1999. So remember the first reference said 80, uh, 52 inquiries from adopted people. Uh, that was in 1986. In 1999, 1,000 queries. And now we're looking again at laughing at us. I think it's very, it's very unfortunate that adopted people continue to be assigned to the Department of Children and Youth Affairs. And almost without fail, in every publication, we are called <coughs> adopted children, um, which is just, it's all part of the diminishment of, of adopted people. And um, it means that we get pushed down to the end of the political agenda at this particular department, child protection always getting the greater, the lion's share of the budget. Now, this is the nuclear option which happened in 2001, and the villain in the piece here is Mary Hannafin. Now, she introduced a bill which incredibly sought to criminalise adopted people. And it was, uh, the crime was, the crime of contacting your natural parents without their express prior permission. And it was punishable by a year in jail and or a 5,000 punt fine. Now, no, if that weren't odious enough, the proposals in the bill were utterly meaningless in that she proposed to do nothing for the tens of thousands of people who were adopted in 2001 and were adults. She was going to allow the status quo to persist there where we have this you know, ongoing debate about identifying and non-identifying information. She was only planning to legislate for open records for those not yet born, not yet adopted, and upon reaching their 18th birthday, at that stage it would have been circa, you know, 2019. And for the rest of us, well, we could just go and sing for it. And she too was a specialist in, again, we see echoes of this, you know, adopted people are individuals or groups that need wider society need uh, protecting from. So we see the word threat and veto being introduced um, into the narrative around this stage. And it took Adoption Ireland two years to get that off the agenda. Draft heads of bill were produced. It was ready to go to committee stage. And it was only at a kind of the 11th hour media woke up to what a nonsensical proposal it was. And it is thanks to the media, it's not due to any political foresight, um, either by stakeholders, by the adoption board, the authority, or the board as it was then, by social workers. This was a media-led uh, campaign which eventually saw this proposal drop. And it was dropped by Brian Lenehan at um, an adoption consultation process in October 2003. Now, I have a slightly different memory of Brian Lenehan to, to Rhoda. Whilst I think uh, he engaged very much with the key stakeholder groups, adoptive people and natural parents. I think he was something of an expert at smoke and mirrors in that he dissipated our energies instead of actually um, continuing to work on the call for legislation. We all got sidetracked and he had us working on various little advisory groups on items, um, on systems that had a non-statutory basis and that really that made everything drop off the radar for a couple of years. He moved on to justice and we were then left with um, some fairly uh, ineffectual individuals. So nothing happened. There was a great vacuum for about five years thereafter. So I like to call this consultation process peace talks, just to continue the analogy about conflict. And I think we did believe that something 
um, amazing was happening that we were all in the room, we were all talking about the issues, everybody was there. But again, it was lip service and a hugely expensive piece of lip service. We were locked down in a Dublin hotel for two days, all expenses, you know, all meals, drinks, whatever provided, and they used the services of a PR company and a facilitation company to uh, gather the views of everybody present, which they didn't publish for a further two years. Again, that helped to dissipate the, the call for um, open adoption records. Now, this, this one um, puzzled me as well. So I felt that in this quotation, they diminished us and managed to agree with us simultaneously. Self-search can be a growth process for adult adopted persons and can provide an opportunity for them to take or regain control of our lives, of their lives. So adopted people are out of control. That's what this quotation says to me. And this appeared in a draft version of protocols, so it's a very, very long, unwieldy title, which we worked on as an advisory group for two years again, weren't published for two further years, and then, as Rhoda has referenced earlier, were never implemented. We were told by the Adoption Board it was down to social worker objection. So if anybody knows different to that explanation, I'd, I'd gladly receive it. And just to... There is one part of in page one of the final document says everything following is contingent on the introduction of legislation. Right. Have yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Smoke, smoke and mirrors again. Now, I want to look at the um, NACPR, the, the gloss about this. Again, this was part of the smoke and mirrors. Launched in 2005 to huge publicity. Again, no money was spared on this. There was a national postal campaign about this. There was a leaflet drop to every household in the country um, looking for people who'd lost relatives, lost contact through adoption to fill out the form and express the level of contact they wanted. And I think Rhoda will back me up on this. It was, a, it was the most, it was like pulling teeth at the advisory group that, set, that sat around where um, the key stakeholders, the natural parents, the adopted people, we were outnumbered three to one by social workers, private, op, uh, private adoption agency workers and by members of the adoption board. And it's interesting the bias which existed in this from the get-go. In the initial draft, the first item that people could tick was no contact. Whereas, you know, uh, who said it earlier on, um, I'm sorry, um, you know, obviously that the default option should be, it was Anne Ferris, Deputy Anne Ferris, she said, the default option should be that we assume everybody wants contact until they inform us otherwise. And, and although actually I am quite wary of the mechanisms that might be allowed or put in place to allow people to register such a no, uh, a no contact preference, because somebody around the table who was opposed to this exercise from the word go uh, illustrated how easy it would be to, she was an adoptive parent, how you could register a no contact preference for your adult adoptive child especially if they, if they were globetrotting, had gone off to Australia for a year. So that was most worrying. Now, the, this, the contact preference register was supposed to have been publicised every two years by a repeat of the national leaflet drop. That never, ever happened. And as I said, you know, we barely are reaching 0.5% matching rates um, on, the, on the preference register. My other objections to it are that the whole point of introducing this was to help reduce the waiting list. It was to get, take people away from the agencies or the HSE, either because of the length of the waiting list or, as Mary Slattery mentioned, because do natural mothers really want to go back to the agencies who took their children in the first instance? So the whole idea was to circumvent that. And what happens now? When a match occurs on the NACPR, people are sent back to the agencies for counselling and entered onto another waiting list and then they're subject to the same invasive vetting process as if they'd never registered with the contact preference register. Um, so there, I have little or no faith in anything improving if this goes on a statutory footing. Obviously, it is one of the few shows in town, uh, Tom, I'd agree with you on that, 
but it will never ever meet the demand that is out there. So in case you thought things were going to get better, they didn't. In 2010, the uh, much waited 2010 Adoption Act uh, was published. And all that happened with that was that the, um, they, we ratified the Hague Convention on Intercountry Adoption. Now that was very, very welcome because really intercountry adoption had been very poorly regular, regularised in Ireland. But we were astonished to discover that there was absolutely zero provision for adoption information and tracing. And in fact, Barry Andrews, who was then the Minister for Children, laughed us out of his office at the suggestion that there would be quite literally. And you can see the text in relation to finding out people's identities is pretty much um, just cut and paste from the 1952 Act. And there's further diminishment in the text here. So again, there's reference to the fact that um, a court shall not make an order to, you know, for discovery of this information unless the court is satisfied that it is in the best interest of any child concerned to make the order. So again, adopted people, irrespective of their age, are always adopted children. And I, I, I found this quote particularly re repugnant, I have to say, and I think it's evidence of the very real um, dislike and hatred of this issue in government circles. Now, it's a coincidence that it's Barry Andrews saying this, if any other minister said it, and if, again, if anybody has evidence of um, a Labour minister saying anything similar, I'd gladly receive it and include it. So he said, no matter how great the desire to meet a birth parent, unregulated contact can give rise to real disappointment and in some cases distress. So this notion of unregulated contact, we're back to this notion that adopted people are somehow unsafe and need controlling. So I've covered that. Now we're into the stage, the fight is on. And Frances Fitzgerald, we were initially very optimistic about when she took over the portfolio of Minister for Children in uh, 2011. Uh, and it was her top priority to introduce a new adoption information and tracing bill. It never saw the light of day and she left her portfolio three and a half years later. But Claire Daly, the independent today, has been wonderful on pursuing this cause for, for us. And she puts in parliamentary questions, you know, ad infinitum. And this, this answer was given whilst the film Philomena was being, was being released around the world. And the whole world was talking about illegal and forced adoptions. With the exception of India, Adoption Rights Alliance has carried out an interview with, with mem journalists from every single country in the world. Well, maybe, you know, uh, some of the former Soviet um, member countries haven't, haven't knocked on our door. But she made this bold statement, which was that all adoptions which the Irish state have been involved in since 1952 have been in line with the Adoption Act of 1952 and subsequent adoption legislation. You think, well, maybe there was an audit carried out, so she must have had evidence of that. Absolutely not. There was no, um, no audit ever carried out of adoption records. And in fact, particularly in light of the tumour elevations, the nobody, so this is what, four months on after the elevations of tumour and Vesper and the other sites of mass graves, Nobody in the Irish state can say just how many adopted people there are in the state. So I think we should be looking at a figure of between 90 and 100,000. And again, another independent um, deputy, Thomas Pringle from Donegal, he raised this with Francis Fitzgerald in February of this year. And he used the, the vernacular, the narrative that was floating around the world. He asked about forced adoptions. And again, I think this is just, she must, Frances Fitzgerald should get top prize for, you know, disingenuousness. I am not quite sure what the deputy means by forced adoptions, but I'm trying to highlight here the information that is available. And really, that was the point at which the whole debate uh, floundered until the rev revelations of June. So despite 
as I said, every media organisation pretty much around the world acknowledging the, um, the crimes which really have been committed against unmarried mothers for, you know, since the formation of the state. The Irish state still refuses to acknowledge that. And every journalist pretty much will ask us about the Philomena effect. And I must really congratulate, I, I'd like to add my congratulations to Phil here today because she lit the torch. And the most important group of people that we need to really energise in all of this are those women in the very, very earliest years of the state, and particularly under the 1952 Act, who still are labouring under the stigma of believing that they did something wrong. And I believe they are the ones who are suffering most. We have been struck at Adoption Rights Alliance, the, the, volume, uh, the increase in volume to our helpline, our email, not necessarily by these older women themselves, primarily by their daughters or their granddaughters who are shocked and astonished to discover that their mothers were involved in this awful racket, or their grandmothers, and they're determined to establish, and I think, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name. Carmel, is it? Yeah, you mentioned that so many of them, they don't even know where their children are, and if those who are aware that their children died can't even say where they're buried. And on that issue of, uh, you know, not knowing where people are. Uh, we have uh, Shona Murray here from News Talk, and she carried out a great interview with um, Sister Sarto from, uh, she was a social worker, and she also ran the accredited adoption agency, the Sacred Heart Adoption Agency, which uh, dealt with all of the information queries um, for the order of the Sacred Hearts of Jesus and Mary. And that was best for Sean Ross Abbey and Castle Pollard. And uh, when Shona asked her about the vaccine trials, she said, oh, listen, nobody died, you know, get over it. It's wor well worth listening back to. And again, that's the level of diminishment that persists around all of these issues. And I fear it will continue in the Commission of Investigation, which the original briefing paper that will inform the terms of reference um, have suggest suggests that it's going to take the narrowest possible approach. So what really we would like to see is that we would have a full drains up um, investigation of everything that happened in any institution, be that a mother and baby home, a county home, a, a state maternity hospital, Hollis Street, the Aaronville and Cork, Galway University Hospital. Some of them actually had separate wards for unmarried mothers where social workers, particularly from the church-run adoption agencies, had free reign to go in and procure children for adoption. So, um, not just that, we, we need to look at um, the trafficking of children to the US. This is actually a picture of Mary Steed. She was just shy of her second birthday, I think. And as Phil said, you know, the relationship that Mary and her mother had in Bespra was very real. They were together for almost two years. Phil and Anthony were together for three and a half. So those of you who are parents here today, imagine you know, think back to when your own children were those ages and imagine them being removed from you at that stage and it, it, it should break all of your hearts really. In legislation, as well as you know, calling for the statutory inquiry, we, always, we also want legislation. And again, this is Groundhog Day. Full access upon reaching 18 to birth certs, information, adoption files and statutory based information and tracing services. Um, and I think sometimes people forget that we're not just talking about, you know, manila files here. We're talking about people's identities, their birthright, the need, the, the knowledge that exists about their original families. We'd also like to see certain um, improvements in some of the regulatory bodies, you know, particularly the, the adoption authority itself, um, that they would actually have more robust um, monitoring of their own um, operations. For, I think at the moment the, um, the authority, is it right Tom, you're still not part of the FOI Act, is that right? No. You're not subject to that? Yeah. I mean, the actual adoption files aren't. Right, yeah. I don't think yeah. And this was all proposed back in 2003 
And in fact, Brian Lenhan indicated, you know, it will be a bit of a slam dunk to ensure that, say, the adoption authority would be subject to um, the ombudsman's oversight. That's never happened either. We'd also like to see the accredited bodies to see their supervision massively improved. And I think really the adoption board um, has questions to answer about how they failed universally pretty much to, to monitor what was going on in these, particularly in the private um, church run agencies. And I've deliberately included St. Patrick's Guild there because despite admitting in the 1990s that they routinely lied to adopted people and natural mothers who came back looking for information, that was actually debated in the Doyle by Francis Fitzgerald and Alan Shatter. When they admitted in 2001 to uh, Tressa Reeves, the natural mother who has been, her story and that of her son have been the subject of a prime time investigates documentary, they admitted to transacting illegal adoptions. And since 1996, it's also been known that they trafficked the highest number of children to the US for adoption. What were the consequences for those actions? Absolutely nothing. St. Patrick's Guild and others like them continued to receive taxpayers' funds. Um, and they are, in, at the moment, they're still operating, still receiving HSE grants. They have never been sanctioned by the Adoption Board and now the Adoption Authority. And in fact, at Adoption Rights Alliance, we believe the only reason they were accredited in 2010 was that somebody forgot the glaring loophole in the 2010 legislation which is that if a private agency chose not to apply for accreditation under the 2010 Act, they could have happily burnt, shredded, dumped all of their files. So that is the level of political incompetence we are dealing with when it comes to this, this subject. Um, we also want to suggest a change to the model of how particularly the HSE might work and again this was something this was a subject aired back in 2003 down in the Ashling Hotel when the adoption of part board got us all together and social workers agreed that yeah, they were not the best people to be do carrying out genealogical um, searches they didn't have the expertise or the training and their skills lay in offering counselling and that's um, that's where they should be working in. And we, we set out various models, alternatives, where professional genealogists would actually do the tracing, or even the Department of Social Welfare. Um, I'm aware of a case at the moment that a natural mother was contacted by the Department of Social Welfare because she couldn't be traced by um, a particular adoption agency. And they very sensibly, instead of wasting their own resources tracking that woman down, they sent a letter to her via the Department of Social Welfare and it got to her. So there are very practical <coughs> solutions which I think would reduce the workload for social workers. And I, would like, I think that social workers should be redeployed away from genealogy and searching databases to the more important work of offering counselling where it's uh, warranted or where it is um, wanted. And I'll just finish up now saying that um, too often in Ireland the, the wider narrative about adoption is that you know, it's, it's a point of sale transaction. We've never offered any, po any post adoption services to adoptive parents in this country. And increasingly that's going to become a bigger problem because um, intercountry adoption, which is on the increase, will increasingly see older, therefore traumatised children. Um, being adopted by Irish couples. They may also have complex physical um, and emotional and he uh, mental health needs as well. And I do not accept the argument that all of this, oh, it happened in the past, they were different times. We need to learn from the history of adoption in Ireland if we're to apply best possible practice to future intercountry adoptions. And we must remember that adoption is not about fulfilling you know, a gap in childless couples' lives. It is about finding secure, loving homes for children who failed to be looked after by their own parents, sorry, 
their parents have failed to look after them and it's not possible to have them adopted in their wider community. So any further information, uh, please log onto our website and you'll see various contact details there. Thank you.